since I was five for money. Uh, I, st I learned so much of what I know, which is not a lot, we agree. But um, I hung around Joe Detroit's garage on Newdorf, Staten Island. No heat, one light bulb, he smoked cheap cigars. And I was Rajo the Helper. I don't know why Rajo the Helper, but when I wasn't in school or captured by my parents, I was at Joe's garage. And he was a self-taught uh, virtuoso of cars. Every Cord, Duesenberg, uh, Auburn, in the New York metropolitan area came to Joe. B-12 Packards and Cadillacs and 16 cylinders and uh, he had the touch. And I had, I'm not a good student. Uh, I'm very dyslexic, major. I'm the poster boy for dyslexia. But Joe, I watched him. Um, I'm a good monkey see, monkey do guy. And that's where I came on. And when I, before I went to school, I was hanging around Joe's garage. And then I started to do brake jobs and stuff for the neighborhood. They gave me money. I couldn't, I was just absolutely stunned. Money. And, uh, Went to Patterson Tech for aviation technology. Very tough school. It, Patterson was a terrible place, and Patterson Technical and Vocational School. Technical means you had to know how and why to stack bricks, how to make mortar and stuff. Vocational means stack one on top of each other, and they had the uh, really good instructor and it was close to right right engines right aircraft engines so we had all the engines every piece of hardware you'd ever want to work on and uh, then out of there the air force and planes and pratt and whitney and then i <laughs> went in business for myself crash Lots of fun, no money, uh, and that's the story. Uh, I usually have black gloves. Uh, I'll go, I'll go swimming when I leave here, and it'll be fairly clean. But now the Y is starting to. What's the oil slick on the pool for? And I tell them, it's the bearings, the seals on the pump, the water pump need to replace. I'll get away with that for a while, and then they'll figure out where it comes from. Foreign Car Shop, Inc., 129 Oakwood Drive, Glastonbury, Connecticut. Um, but uh, one of my customers had a Peugeot. Sad thing, a Peugeot. The early, early bathtub one. Um, about all comes said for a Peugeot, it had comfortable seats, which rotted out and then they tipped over in the back. But um, her husband was the vice president of Gerber Scientific Instrument. And uh, one year, he'd come into the business suit with his attache case and say, can I put some parts in the parts washer? Sure, go ahead. And it turns out he was building a Formula V race car in his cellar, the first autodynamic sold to a public person. Autodynamics, Marblehead Mass, a builder of kit cars and race cars, you know, that. And when it was all done, uh, he, <laughs> he found out he couldn't get it out of the cellar, so the hangers around at the shop, we went over, tipped it up and marched it out the bulkhead, you know, and he took it up to Lime Rock uh, to try it and uh, came back kind of scared. And Joe Gerber at the time said, no. 
So he came in, and my father had previously given me a high school trophy case, you know, this is glass and white wood. It was in the back of the shop, and I had all the stuff I would won in Europe and Germany and, uh, you know. And <laughs> he, he walked up to the case, he said, do you race? I said, no, that's for barroom betting and some other stupid thing I said, I don't know. And he said, here, uh, you can drive my race car, you have to join the SECA and get a helmet. So I did that. And um, turned out we were the fastest Formula V in Christendom. Two years, I had one second place in a DNF. No, it wasn't DNF, it was just fourth or fifth. The cam went bad. He put the motor together, it was a... Anyway, we were very fast. And then he, uh, so my shop, I, I worked on local stuff. And then when the sun went down, I worked on people's race cars and engines and stuff, which is a true love, you know. Uh, don't be satisfied with it, make it go faster type stuff. Huh. Huh. Mm. Mistakes were made. Uh, but basically it turned out pretty good. And from there, uh, he bought a Cooper, a little, I don't even know about Cooper cars, a little rear mid-engine, Jackie Stewart. He won the, Nash the European World Formula Junior class in it. He never won a race because the little Sprite the factory, it was supposed to be a Sprite engine. It was a little bit better than that. And, uh, but it wasn't, it, the Fords at the time uh, were five main bearings and special cylinder heads, downdraft carburetors, overhead cam, and six speed transmissions. And uh, the power band was about that wide and the Cooper went, you know, chug, 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 chug. And um, so I short shifted those boys into hell and, you know, they go, quick shift. And we did quite well with that for two years. And then we were at Watkins Glen and Logan said, got to see this car. And we went over and there was a crosslay. And when you see a crosslay, Northern Ireland, Rory's Wood, Knocknagoni, Belfast, it just is perfection. John Crosslay graduated with a degree in agriculture and wanted to go racing, so he started building cars for himself. And Crosslay Car Company in Ireland, Northern Ireland, is the longest continual building of race cars in the world. Because he's, he, Lola came, Lola went, Lola went, uh, went, Crosslay. And um, we, the car we looked at was a Formula B. B is 1,600 cc's, uh, twin over, has to be from a sedan. Um, and uh, Cortina had a, a Lotus Elan engine in it, two, car, two cams, two Webers. And this, the B car came with a Cosworth, which was 145 horse, but it had a cast iron crank, so you dared not go to 7,000, or it went boom. And another customer of mine, Richard Auer, who was, uh, I worked on his Ferrari. He had a early Ferrari America. And it was uh, a bit cantankerous. Ferraris are uh, about eight to one. One hour on the road, eight hours in the shop. You know, it's, 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 ratio varies from model to model, but the, the message is still there. Um, 
it helps to have a pile of hundreds that high if you're going to have the oil checked. Uh, but um, so he just came and said, "You should get a better car." And I said, "Yeah, I should be handsome too." And you know where that you know where that discussion went. He disappeared, came back with his he when he got out of the Air Force in the Second World War, he went to Africa to shoot game and. And he came back with a brooch, a jewel brooch of jewels this big. He said, went into Hartford, came back with $5,000 and said, go get it. Drove out to Bradford, Pennsylvania in the old split window truck, VW truck with a... <laughs> oh. Nobody ever really... I never got stopped for speeding in the truck. Um, the brakes wouldn't have stopped anyway, so well, what's the difference? So um, that led to um, absolute track record at Lime Rock in the first race that fall. Um, knocked it down under a minute, 58.9 or something. I don't remember what it was. It took a while for them to catch up with that. No wings, no slicks, just a joyous car. It, the whole time I owned it, I never adjusted the suspension, never touched it. Because when John Crossley builds a car, when you get it, it's set. And you don't have to tinker with sway bars. If you do, it goes slower. Um, he, he's quite a clever man. He passed away, unfortunately. Um, and then the next year was 68. We won the national championship. Uh, by 54 seconds ahead of the second place car. Um, and we had the pole by three or four seconds. John sent over some new tires. Firestone European. Ha, ha, ha. And um, you give a fool like me good tires, <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta pay the fiddler. <laughs> and um, then I was so badly in debt I had to work at the shop and do that stuff. And then he sent over an A car, Formula A, do you know what that is? Big Chevy V8. We couldn't afford to run it and it didn't handle well at all compared to the B car. The B car was like the perfect foil. You know, it wasn't a broadsword, but it just you could just do things with it. I mean, it just it was just the perfect car. And a couple of years of trying to fool with that, and then he came out with Ford's, Formula Ford. And it turned out that John Crossley's Formula Ford was the one you had to have. I sold nine of them in the first year. And to this day, vintage four-wheel Ford, you have to have a 30, uh, 32F crossplay, or you can't win. And that's his bread and butter. He he builds a beautiful uh, modified two-seater. It, it's just it's exquisite, called a ninety-five, and. Um, before he passed away, he did a, a trials car. Two guys stuffed in this funny thing with big tires and bicycle wheels, and they ride up and down on grass cliffs and stuff, and then one guy is hanging out and balancing. <sighs> There's all sorts of things. Oh, interesting, I worked for another person and it wasn't working out. Uh, anyway, uh, I was there 15 or 16 years. I sold the shop because it was just, couldn't, I had partners, the government, the state, you know, this one and that one, and uh, one man couldn't do it. And Especially when, especially a bum that wanted to race cars, <laughs> yeah, and. Uh
and that one guy deals in foreign cars. And um, he had some Porsches that just didn't behave. And I was out there, I got tools in the back of my car, and I crawl around on the floor, and, and they run good. And he said, oh, look, you go up, up 9W, get off that exit, come on, you see pa paddock sign. And I came in here, and it was, first I thought I'd died and gone to heaven because I owe, essentially I owe my success in life at the moment to Mike and Pat because they said, you know, we want to. And here I am and I've never been happier. I've had jobs since I was, um, and this is the happiest place I've ever worked. I wish I were stronger and not as old so I could produce more. I don't know how long they're gonna keep me. Uh, maybe for amusement's sake, you know. Look at the old fart. <laughs> uh, hobbling around and, but I get to work on nice cars with nice people in a nice shop. That's the story of me, boring, isn't it?